Oh, man. There it is. Can you all see my screen? I do. That's cute. <laughs> OK, well, then I guess so. All right, then we are good to go. All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Lisa Lunghofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization. I have almost one o'clock here, East Coast time. I see a number of participants just joining, so we'll just wait another minute, and then I will introduce Dr. Becker, and we'll get started. All right, so why don't we go ahead and begin. As I said, I'm Lisa Lunghofer. I am the Executive Director of the Gray Muzzle Organization, and I am delighted to welcome all of you to today's webinar. Um, I'm also equally delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. He's spent his life working toward better health for pets and the people who love them. And Gray Muzzle is really lucky to count him as one of our advisory board members. He's the founder of Free, Fear Free, which works to prevent and alleviate fear, anxiety, and stress in pets by inspiring and educating the people who care for them, including veterinary and other pet professionals, as well as pet parents. Dr. Becker was the resident veterinary, veterinary contributor on Good Morning America for 17 years. He's written 23 books that have sold almost 8 million copies, including three New York Times bestsellers. He's an adjunct professor at his alma mater, the Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and he practices at North Idaho Animal Hospital because he loves veterinary medicine, pets, and the people who care for both. So we are very happy, Dr. Becker, to have you here with us today, and we're excited to, to um, hear your thoughts. Before we get started, I want to let everybody um, on the line know that hopefully you'll see a box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen where you can type questions for Dr. Becker. He'll speak for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions after that. So we, we encourage you to type in your questions and, and we, we like to encourage interaction. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Becker. Well, Lisa, first of all, if I could get a hold of you, I'd give you a hug or a high five. I, I so appreciate the work that you do. And uh, I'm on a few boards, but I'm so proud to be a board member for Gray Muzzle and help support the great work that you do. And also, I want to give you a high five for pronouncing veterinarian right. So many <laughs> people, it's really hard to pronounce right. There's six syllables. And uh, most people say vet or doc, you know, they don't they go to the vet. If you ever, if anybody out there that's listening, if you ever want a tip, just say veteran. Just like somebody that's coming back that's been in the military service, veteran, veteran, and then you just Aryan add in the end, veteran, Aryan, veteran, Aryan. But you did it perfectly, and that's not common, so good job. <laughs> well, thank you. And I also wanted to, to share with our attendees today that we had hoped to be able to actually see you but because of some technical difficulties, we decided that we, we didn't want to sacrifice the sound quality. So we're going to share very cute beneficiaries of gray muzzle grants while you're speaking. Well, I, I live up in the mountains of northern Idaho. So when you, Idaho, if you ever want to do really well on Trivial Pursuit, I just played Trivial Pursuit again the other day. That's a fun game. And in the original Trivial Pursuit, there's a question, what state is surrounded by six states in a foreign country? And that is Idaho. So if you go clockwise, starting, uh, you've got Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington State. Up at the top, it's called the panhandle, or the stovepipe of Idaho. 
there's a, it gets uh, straight up, 75 miles straight up and then 45 miles across in this rectangle. And we live right up at the top. So when you're standing on our deck, it's 15 miles to Montana, it's 30 miles to Washington State and right behind us, it's seven miles to Canada. And I, I almost wished we could have had video today because uh, working from my home, I don't shower that often. I actually showered today, so I wished I could show up. I actually have clean hair <laughs> and I've shaved today, but sadly, the internet connection is not the best. And we wanted to have, I suggested we have really good audio versus herky jerky things that drives everybody crazy. But my little dog, Cutie Pie, who's, uh, you know, we all have our little heart dogs and this dog is just the absolute love of my life of all the dogs I've ever had before. He's sitting there right behind, by me here in his little contented crescent of fur. So I'll just have to, have to describe him. He's, um, he's a Chihuahua Jack Dachshund cross that flew up on wings of rescue from California with his mother and six siblings, all got distemper and he was the only one that survived. But he's, he's about two dogs long and a half a dog tall, if you know what I mean. <laughs> he's uh, he's quite, the, quite the looker there with that uh, dachshund inside of him, but looks like a Jack Russell Terrier, but the, the ears straight up like a Chihuahua. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about Fear Free. So, you know, I'm a neighbor of Canada up here, and I was in Canada October of 2009 at a seminar. And I don't know if anybody out here can identify with this, but I was in, I was given the keynote address one day and the next day was Karen Overall, Aborted Behaviors from Penn. And I was in the back of the room. I love to sit in the back of the room. I did all through college. I still do when I go to seminars. And I was looking at my Franklin Covey day planner, checking my AOL account. That's how old I, I still use an AOL account as a matter of fact, which is great now since uh, I'm at this stage of life where walk-in showers and, and uh, constipation products are, are uh, I'm their target market now. Um, and I was back there and I was, you know, kind of distracted looking at this and all of a sudden Karen started talking about fear. And it, I, I remember she said, fear is the worst thing a social species could experience and it causes permanent damage to the brain. That those of us that deal with animals, whether it's veterinarians, groomers, trainers, um, boarding, daycare, dog walking, we're causing repeat severe psychological damage to pets by what we were doing or not doing. Fear was caused by something painful or disturbing. And her examples, painful is getting the nails trimmed too short. Now disturbing is seeing the nail trimmers. Painful is a botched catheter placement or vaccination or blood draw. Now disturbing may be hearing the clippers smelling alcohol being on this table or seeing that syringe uh, that you're going to vaccinate or draw blood from. It may also be in grooming where their clipper burned or the clippers get hot. Now just hearing the sound of the clippers causes them. So something painful or something disturbing. She went on to explain about how maladaptive fear develops, that when, a, say, a puppy comes in the first time, they're inquisitive, they're eager, their little old amygdala, that little almond-shaped thing in the, deep in the brain that stores these experiences, hasn't been swollen with negativity yet. She explained how there's mistakes made before they even get into the veterinary hospital. And this is the same thing going into the shelter, going into grooming or going into boarding. If there's feces out there from a pet that's been stressed, those anal gland secretions have fear pheromones. And there's always that vertical surface. God, I'd hate to be a tree outside of the, right outside the front door of a veterinary hospital or shelter. Uh, every vertical surface, they go over and they check their P-mail and then they leave a little message of their own. More fear pheromones coming in. Now in the, you know, the limbic system of the brain's alive with fear before they even got inside. Somebody's coming into the vet hospital. They got the cat and the carrier, a dog. They're swinging it like the pirate ride at Six Flags. Uh, often you see them come in with no towel or anything and the pet slipping from one side. The carrier's held at a Johnny angle like the Titanic going down. They bang through the doors, go inside there. What a mess. Inside there is this casserole of stew pot of stress, insta pot of stress with other people, other pets. Fear pheromones in the air, good intention. People come up to the, the puppy or the newly acquired pet at the shelter. Oh my gosh, where'd you get it? Oh, what'd they say it was? You extend your hand, look down, 
three mistakes. One, you're looming over them. Two, you have direct eye contact. Three, you're extending a, an arm. They've smelled you before they even saw you. And by looming down, you're Halloween, big, scary. Instead, what you do, by the way, is you turn sideways, you squat down, you avoid eye contact, and then try to lure them to you, hopefully by using a treat. So it's what we call in fear free call and put in the treat into treatment. They get on the scale, more fear pheromones. Then they go into the clinic. And what do you do? You put them up on a table. Uh, I don't know about you uh, and the people that are participating here, but cutie pie is not up on the table at home and neither are other dogs. And cats, we always try to shoo them off the counter. So what do you do? You put them up on a table or a counter. We always loved it because it was slippery and it was elevated. And so they tended not to jump up. Then you have direct eye contact. Most veterinarians, veterinary nurses start the exam looking at the tip of the nose for a discharge and look right directly in the eyes. And then we get out the old magic stethoscope. Guess what's on the stethoscope? Unless there's been parvo or influenza or something come in, fear pheromones. The most iconic thing in medicine has fear pheromones. We take their temperature. Ooh, that hurt. That was one way until just a minute ago. What was that? And those of only of us that work in the veterinary hospital know that when you're holding them by their tail and you're taking their temperature, you're literally holding them up by their tail. That there is no, uh, their feet are just barely touching the ground. Sometimes they're off the ground. Then we give them our vaccinations. Let's call it three bee stings. Set that pet down and it hauls ass out of there into a gear it didn't even know it had. From that point forward, they know what door you come in from and they know what door they escape from. They come in slow and they go out fast. So now it's time for the second set of vaccinations. They come in, it may be the same hospital, same nurse, same doctor, same receptionist, the same, the whole, everything, same, same number of vaccinations, but they have even more fear, anxiety, and stress in response to the same set of circumstances. Now we come time for the last visit. They've got maladaptive fear. The carrier coming out, getting in the car, turning this direction, pulling up in front here. They have PTS, panic attack, uh, maladaptive fear. They don't even have to go in to, they don't have to smell the feces of the vertical surface or have somebody look them in the eye or get on the scale or the table. And, and in the past, we just thought, well, what are you going to do about it? It's, you know, you saw the signs of fear, anxiety, and stress. They're staring. They're their brow is furrowed, their ears are laid back, their tail is down, they're pantering, they're shivering, they're shaking, they're growling, they're biting, they're barking, they're scratching, they're jumping, they're hiding, they're leaning away. They have this stare, what we call whale-eyed, um, desperately trying to get out that door that they not go in. And then when they get in there, try to get, lean by, sit by, want to surge towards that door that they escape from, they open. But hey, I was, we thought that's collateral damage. There's nothing you can do. Well, when Karen Overall got done with their talk, I, I literally felt nauseous. I, I, you know, nobody gets involved helping animals to make life worse for animals, whether you're in the veterinary profession, grooming, training, boarding, daycare, dog walking, or just a pet mom or dad. The, quite the opposite. We want them to look at their physical and emotional well being. And, and simply put, that's what Fear Free is. We just look at the emotional well-being of animals. So after that meeting uh, in October of 2009, I went back to the Board of Behaviorists who had talked to me about this before. Okay, how do we do this? How do we, and I love our slogan, take the pet out of petrified. And we went back and started working with Board of Behaviorists. There are 83 Board of Behaviorists by the American College of Veterinary Behavior. And of those 80 Board of Behaviorists, 63 are part of the Fear Free Advisory Group. That's the bedrock of Fear Free. Add to that PhD behaviorists. Brian Hare, the head of animal cognition at Duke. Alexander Horwitz, the head of animal cognition at Columbia University. The head of ethology at MIT. The head of integrative medicine at the Mayo Clinic. And then Temple Grandin. Uh, Temple Grandin, this this angel of a person who we always thought of as you know being able to see through the eyes and be in the mind of a of cattle or something is incredible when it looks at how to treat these animals. So we spent all this time between 2009 and 2016 figuring out how to do it. 
we formed a steering committee that formed eight task forces. Those eight task forces, each task force created one of the modules of level one fear-free certification. We launched April 1st of 2016 and hoped by the end of the year, a thousand people would have taken the course. Well, guess what? By the end of the year, 10,000 people had taken the course. And now uh, in April 1st, we'll be four years old and we'll be between 75 and 80,000 individuals have completed fear-free certification. There's veterinarians in 46 countries that are fear-free certified. And in addition, uh, fear-free is complementary to all veterinary students, nursing and staff, all veterinary, excuse me, all veterinary students, nursing and staff, all veterinary nursing students, faculty and staff, and of the 30 veterinary schools in North America, and I want you to listen closely to this, of the 30 veterinary schools that currently exist in North America, two more are being uh, worked on right now, 21 require fear-free certification of all students. Require, you cannot graduate unless you've taken fear-free certification. So little old farm boy, Marty Becker, who went to veterinary school to be a dairy practitioner and the legendary Leo Bustad gave his talk on the human animal bond in his introductory remarks. And Marty went from dairy to uh, a companion animal practitioner the first hour, the first day of, of school. Uh, it's amazing to think that we learned how to hog tie, how to cast a horse off its feet, how to use a squeeze chute, uh, have uh, what we call pilotex restraint, which is what you typically see where it looks like a rugby scrum holding down a poor pet to trim its nails. And now they're learning, instead of learning restraint, they're learning the, the techniques in, free, in Fear Free, which are considered approach where you don't have eye contact, you don't loom over them, which uh, the things in Fear Free, which you have gradient touch. You think of a small animal like a, like a, um, a horse, basically, it's touch, touch, tint the skin, touch, touch, tint the skin, instead of the startling them. And then um, uh, gentle control. So it's, you still get positional compliance, but it's done in a way that, uh, you know, it's still safe, but, but the pets are, are relaxed and stuff into there. It's just such a difference. We call it putting the treat into treatment. So we started out with, you know, working with the veterinary profession with dogs and cats. Now avian and exotics is done. It'll be released uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, then uh, the equine task force is formed. That's led by the Dean of Texas A&M. Uh, that'll be up later this year. Then the dairy cow led by the Dean of Cornell. And then it's gonna be wildlife. It's gonna be in research. And so basically all animals globally will benefit from this program where we look at the emotional well-being of animals. And many of you that are probably on here have always treated your own pets, your, uh, if you have, uh, you know, goats or sheep or cattle or horses. The thing that's interesting is we've always looked at the emotional well-being of our own animals, or many of us have anyway, but we didn't think about the emotional well-being of our, of our patients or the stuff with our clients. So it wasn't just good enough to do, you know, have a great uh, visit to the veterinarian where uh, the, you know, you had a literally in, in fear free, in a typical, let me go back in a typical veterinary hospital, you try to drag the dog into the hospital and then it drags you out in fear free, literally the dog drags you into the hospital and you have to try to drag it back out. I was practicing last week, I think I saw 15 different clients, uh, not all dogs, but three times on a dog. I went out to talk to them about some uh, enzyme impregnated chews, basically an edible toothbrush for their dog. And I turned around and they weren't with me. I thought they were walking right behind me and they couldn't get the dog to leave the exam room. It looked, they had the leash trying to drag it out. It looked like they had, a, had, a, had hooked a marlin trying to get it out of the exam room. The dog still thinks there's, something, there's some treat in there or it's gonna get a massage or there's a ball in there. So in a fear-free thing, we have the pets come in hungry so they respond better to food rewards. We have amazing food rewards for them, the things that they don't get at home. We give them the choice of where they're examined. Very few are done up on the table. We have this magic carpet ride of pheromones. Uh, there's a lot of use of nutraceuticals that are uh, products like uh, milk protein extracts called Zilkeen. The pheromones are adaptable and feel away. We uh, often give things to uh, pro products to calm them, FDA approved products to calm them. 
but there's no way you're going to go into a fear-free practice and see a pile of text restraint in the back of 600 pounds of people holding down a, a 10 pound cat or a 30 pound dog to trim their nails. And there's no way. I had a dog last, th last Thursday when I practiced that had a great visit and all of a sudden he heard this noise and it started panting, just, <laughs> sniffing, gulp, clawing at the door. In the past, we would have just taken it in the back where nobody could see anything and piled on some people and got the procedure done. But like I told the, the client, I'm not going to sacrifice your pet's term, long-term emotional well-being for the convenience of getting this done today. We have three choices. We can retreat and come back a different day a different way, uh, maybe with a, a pre-visit pharmaceutical. We can give something orally, and if you've got an hour to wait, a half hour to hour to wait, and let it take effect and see how we do, or we can go straight to sedation. But no, we are not going to fill this amygdala with yet another negative experience at the, the veterinary hospital. So that's, that's kind of the, the tale of how this, how this started. It started out with being um, just moved to the core by this boarded veterinary behaviorist about what the trauma we're inflicting upon pets. But then we found out it was just, you know, we take an oath as a veterinarian or a veterinary technician or nurse to prevent or relieve animal pain and suffering. And I tell you, unlike some of our senators, I think an oath is, is a very important thing that you honor your oath. And when you realize that you are not only preventing or relieving animal pain and suffering, but you are causing it by what you were doing or not doing, oh, that's a hard pill to swallow. Soon found out it was better medicine so often in it, they call the vital signs, temperature, pulse, respiration, TPR. Often you'll have a pet come in and instead of 101.5, it's temperature's 103. But yeah, it's just because it's been shivering and shaking. It's like what you do when you try to, just like when you're cold and you shiver, you build up heat. Well, when it's warm and you're shivering, you build up heat too. And so you might have a temperature 103. Is that an infection, a fever, or is that just stress? And the heart rate, 140 to 150, the same heart that if it was in rehab, it'd be 90 to 100 and at home was 55 to 65. Could that be tachycardia, an increased heart rate, this pathology, or is it just because it's stressed? And same thing with respiration. Then when you go to your blood chemistries, you see what we call a leukocyte shift. The spleen, okay, it's fight or flight. The spleen, that reservoir of blood squeezes out. Now you have more right blood cells, a higher red blood cell count, have more blood glucose to, flu to fuel the fight or the flight. Well, what if the pet was calm and there was an increase in blood glucose? Could it be pre-diabetic? -di pre what if the white blood cell count was actually higher, not from stress, but because there was an infection? So you start to see what happens. Right thing to do, better medicine, a lot fewer injuries. You know, so many pets in the back, caution, fractious pet, you know, there's warning signs in red with white lettering, like uh, that's so visible, they see it from a thing, it's, you know, bad actor, bad dog, bad cat. Now we've replaced all of with caution, uh, fearful cat or fearful dog, rather than being in a fight with a fractious, a fractious dog or cat to protect us, we're in a fight to protect this cat or this dog. It's a totally different way of looking at it. 99, there are some very aggressive dogs. There are some very aggressive cats. 99% of the time, literally, they, it's fear-based aggression. They think they're gonna die. And when you're gonna die, you will fight for your life. And so it's so much different in the injury rates. So in fact, now, if you have three certified fear-free people in a practice, you get a 20% discount on workers' comp. So right thing to do, better medicine, fewer injuries. It's getting easier to attract and retain people now if you embrace this philosophy because they're learning it in school. Uh, pet owners are, are, are pushing it down. The new, new generation of veterinarians and veterinary nurses and groomers and trainers and board and stuff are pushing it up. And people don't want to work in a place where any, any of you out there that are a participant that's ever been a veterinary technician or a kennel attendant, you've probably woken up the next morning and felt, oh gosh, I'm sore. And it's because you struggle to help hold down a dog or, or something in some one of those rodeo judo throws, pile of text restraint, rugby scrum, and you're sore. Well, think of the pet that was held down by you know, a, a 
10 pound cat held down by 600 pounds of people or stretched into two zip codes where its head was in in Tampa and its ass was in St. Petersburg. Just think of how sore they are. So right thing to do, better medicine, fewer injuries, easier to attract and retain people. We now, some studies now, it's more profitable to do it that way. And I think the, the best thing is it's just more fun. You know, most of us that deal with animals, we love animals and want them to love us back. And before Fear Free in most hospitals and most things in grooming, you loved animals and they hated you back. You have to think about this, and this is an important part to understand, a pet, an animal, I happen to live on a horse ranch in northern Idaho, but let's just say pet. It's the same for a horse, same for a cow, uh, same for a sheep or a goat. Or a chicken. They have no idea why any procedure benefits them, and they can't anticipate or expect the relief uh, of pain or fear, anxiety, and stress, even if it's moments away. And let me give you an example in a story. July 10th of last year, my daughter took her puggle in to uh, because the, the dog was carrying its, its uh, right rear leg. She takes it to the vet. Well, first of all, the vet doesn't know, doesn't know, is it a nail? Is it in the ankle? Is it in the knee? Is it in the hip? Is there a thorn in the bottom of the foot? They come in lame. And so you got to figure out why they're lame. And Willie, uh, the, the dog doesn't have any idea why the, why the procedure benefits them. They're going to put me up on this table and they're going to manipulate this. Why does taking this leg through the range of motion help? And they can't think, okay, this is going to last two minutes and then they're going to stop and then they're going to prescribe some medication. My wife goes in with her knee on July 11th. She can tell the doctor, I hurt this leg initially riding on a motorcycle with my old boyfriend in college, initial injury. Then I re-injured it teaching elementary PE. This is how much it hurts and where. And when they start to manipulate it, you can go, oh, 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 oh that hurts, that hurts. And so they back off. And you know, it's gonna be a few minutes. You know, they're gonna prescribe something for pain. You know why they're doing it. And if they, even if they don't prescribe something, you can take an OTC product and, uh, and relieve the pain yourself. So every time a pet comes in or an animal, they don't know why any procedure, a nail trim, uh, vaccinations, checking a wound. And moreover, if you remember the early on this talk, fear is caused by something painful or something disturbing. Other than wellness visits, almost everything you go to the veterinary hospital hurts. They've got a skin infection. They've got an ear that looks like a fire pit. They've got gums that look like a flamethrower went across it. They've got a torn nail. They've got, uh, they've had diarrhea. They've got an abscess and, and lung infection, so on. So they associate the pain with the person or the place. So, and now it's really cool. We developed a program for the homes called Fear Free Happy Homes. It's free to all pet owners. There's, uh, we want these pets, it's no longer uh, acceptable for a pet owner to have a pet that's freaked out at 4th of July or hunting season like it is in Northern Idaho uh, certain times of the year, or we'll have uh, be down in Tampa or live around Disneyland and be freaked out of fireworks every night. It's not, it's not acceptable that we don't look at the emotional well-being of noise phobias, uh, you know, lease aggression, excessive barking, separation anxiety and things. So when you go to Fear Free Happy Homes, there's over a million dollars worth of content on there that's animated. The reason it's animated, I described this little 18 pound dog for you a minute ago. If I've got a little Chihuahua, Dachshund, Jack Russell cross, and you show me a Great Dane uh, in a video, I'll think, well, that's, that's a big dog. That's not like my small dog and vice versa. If you show a picture of a Rottweiler and I've got a, a, a you know, a 20 pound Cocker Spaniel, I think, well, that's a big dog issue or something with retrievers. So if you see animation, you, you just think it's a dog. You don't think it's not something that looks like mine. And then fearfreeshelters.com, we got to realizing, you know, if some of you are as old as I am, you can actually remember your parents looking at the Sunday classified ads. So Big business, yellow pages were big business. That's where you found something. And the Sunday classified ads were even more than the Wednesday classified ads, cost a fortune. You were gonna get a pet and it was typically a purebred in, uh, in our part of the world. So we went to look for a new Labrador retriever puppy. 
and you'd look in the paper and you could tell by the prefix how far away they were from you because lo and behold we'd never go 30 miles to twin falls idaho that was like six times a year went something closer went to their house paid by cash or check uh, and a lot of you out there remember the crazy directions your parents would have way before there was uh, google maps you went to the grocery store i can literally remember there was 16 feet in this large grocery store of pet supplies that was it and now it's you know one to two aisles mainly prina and and Prina and uh, they were, I think they might have had gravy train Prina Alpo maybe there's some gravy train there you guys remember the the Prina little horses and chuck wagon that would come out from the open the counter up and the dog would chase the horses and the chuck wagon around the kitchen oh god I wanted that the stuff and I wanted those milk bone dog biscuits the only treats you saw were milk bones and rawhide but no no we're a farm family so we're going to give it scraps and some Prina puppy chow then you made an appointment to get the pet puppy shots. Well, now most pets are, thank God, are adopted at the shelter. We've gone from 21, 22 million dogs being euthanized, dogs and cats being euthanized in the uh, early 80s to, by best estimates, it's under 750,000 dogs and cats, mostly cats euthanized. A lot of these dogs have been rehomed a few times or coming from other shelters or other parts of the country. Many of them have uh, socialization behavior issues, but You've also, those of us that have been involved with the shelter world, see the poor pet that's being relinquished for some reason. It can be economic, it can be housing issues or, or uh, relationship issues. And you see that pet that was on the couch last night and it's gonna be in the cage uh, this morning. And so we had a separate program created at fearfreeshelters.com. That's free to all shelter communities. And that was created by the shelter medicine people at University of Florida, led by Brenda Griffin, also the Maddie's Fund, the San Francisco SPCA, and the shelter medicine people at UC Davis. So I, I jokingly say that program has more fingerprints on it than People Magazine at the dentist office. Uh, but there was a small working group. It's an incredible program. It's only been out uh, less than six months, and I believe 28,000 people have signed up for that program, and over 50% have completed it. I think there's, there's uh, somewhere around 15,000 people have completed it. So anybody that works in the shelter community or animal rescue can take the, go to fearfreeshelters.com and take it. It's a five-hour course. And it's amazing, most free courses, there are very few, uh, I think it's around 10% of people that complete uh, a free course. And we have over 50% completing a five hour free course. So you start to see how it works. You're gonna adopt a pet at a, at a, a shelter that embraces fear free. It's gonna live in a fear free happy home. It's going to go to a fear-free veterinarian and then be referred to fear-free groomer, fear-free trainer, fear-free boarding, fear-free daycare. So if you think of a wagon wheel, the fear-free veterinarian is in the middle and these spokes all come out, all, every, all of us that, uh, that interact with pets. And then uh, there's some other people working on some software that might link us together. So the folks at Gray Muzzle could talk about a pet with the vet who could talk to it about the groomer and the trainer and we could all I'll do it together. And, and I think I'll, I, I may take a pause here. I want to tell you one last thing. For me, this is a charity uh, issue. I was only home 40 days last year. In fact, my family had an intervention with me over the holidays to not work so hard on this. But this, is, this thing is to make a difference, not, make, not create wealth. It's to, it's to have major impacts with sustained ripples. So I'm giving... Um, of the, I own 75% of Fear Free and I've signed my wife, uh, Teresa and I, my beloved wife of 41 years, we're giving 76% of that to Washington State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, when, if and when it sells. But we wanna fund the uh, fund chairs in the emotional well-being of canine, feline, porcine, bovine, avian, equine, and then fund research and then hopefully endow the Center for the Study of Animal Well-Being at Washington State University. So you'll have the Leo Bustad Center for the Human Animal Bond, the Veterinary School, the Paul Allen Center for Global Health, and what's called Seesaw, the Center for the Study of Animal Well-Being. But we want to, you know, before we turn to dust here, have, 
have no where we're going to look at the emotional well-being of all animals across the planet whether it's a beast of burden in cuba that's you know sickened me when i watched him being whipped uh by they probably saw their grandfather whip a horse and their father whip a horse and they whip a horse where they're using them like for farm equipment and in transportation not knowing the damage physically and emotional damage that they're doing to those animals so i think i'll stop there i could i get evangelical i feel like a prophet on this i do want you to know fear free is we not me there's 250 people on the fear free advisory group 63 of those are boarded veterinary behaviorists what i bring to this is um, a dogged determination a passion uh, the ability to popularize something and a network but you know, there's um, Steve Ettinger, probably the world's best known veterinarian, is our chief medical officer. We had a, a head of research. We had a in, uh, head of environmental enrichment. We have an environmental uh, clinical bioethics. It's an incredible team of people all trying to do the same thing, and that's to optimize the health, happiness, and longevity of pets and beyond that to animals. So I'm going to stop there. If you had, I think you might have some questions for me, Lisa. Yes, well, thank you very much, Dr. Becker. That was really in, both informative and inspirational. It's really tremendous how much progress you have made in these last just couple of years since you started the, the training. So that's phenomenal. So we do have one question. Um, do you find pet owners more open to medicating a fearful pet at the vet? Some vets have told me that something it's challenging for one reason or the other. Here's the thing about here's the thing about calming a pet. It's it took you want it's hard to believe this. In in nineteen I graduated in nineteen eighty from veterinary school, having been taught that pets didn't feel pain, animals didn't feel pain, literally. And if but the caveat if they did it was good because they were immobile. I.e., we fixed the sutures. They wouldn't you know we we fixed a broken leg and they wouldn't move on it. Of course they were. What, you believed it because I guess because the professor said it. I don't know how you could think they didn't feel pain. You step on their feet, they cry out. You know, there you see it in their eyes, or you dehorn a cow and it and it bellers. You know, I, I don't know how we could have believed that, but it's only in the last decade that we embraced multimodal pain management. And in multimodal pain management, sometimes uh, a lot of times it's getting rid of weight, excess weight. It's exercise. It's nutraceuticals. It may be uh, glucosamine. It can be uh, in uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It can be fish oil, but it's a multimodal approach. And that's the same thing with Fear Free. Some pets, just with a compression garment, a thunder shirt, do really well. Other pets with, with pheromones and a thunder shirt do well. Others, just by coming in, we have certain days for the most sensitive pet, not walking through the front door, coming in a side door, during a time when there's not other, uh, you know, vocal or aggressive pets on works. Uh, there's nutraceuticals. There's one's called anxetane, which is a green tea extract. Another one is uh, zilkine, which is a milk protein. Those, are, those work really well if they're used in the right dosages for the right amount of time. And then other times, if you think to this amygdala, this amygdala is about the size of an almond in a human. How that thing can store all these negative experiences, I'll never know. You know, I'd love to forget about my folks arguing about getting a divorce when I was young. They were in the kitchen. I'd be in my bedroom crying. Oh, please don't get a divorce. Please don't get a divorce, you know. Well, it, it can't. It remembers fights with uh, classmates and girlfriends. It remembers car accidents. It remembers being held down to lance an abscess on the end of my finger by three people, uh, remembers painful injections, it remembers my granddaughter having RSV virus and not showing us, knowing if she was gonna live. So, so many of these pets, we don't know everything that's in their amygdala. You can't scrub it out, plus they don't know the procedure benefits them and they don't know when it's over. So a lot of those, you have to use a pharmaceutical. And when we tell clients, we tell them, we don't say we're going to give something to sedate your pet. We tell them we're going to give something to help calm your pet. So many of the cats that come in are on gabapentin and many of the dogs that come in are on trazodone. It's, it's inexpensive. It's safe. It's very effective. And we used to joke that cats that came to a veterinary hospital were effed. 
as in fight, flight, freeze, or fidget. But with a little gabapentin, it's like, oh, far out, man. This is nice. You can just see it in their eyes. And uh, that's what you want. You don't want it to where people feel like they're hurting their pet by trying to help them. That's why, that's why they don't go to the vet and instead go to, you know, one of the super the chains of pet stores and buy super premium foods thinking that's the that's going to solve all their problems when all it does is let their dog or cat take a five dollar poop once a day um so we have another question is there a fear-free certification for pet sitters it's going to be coming it's going to okay. be coming. It'll be part of part of the. We're going to have something for pet sitters, dog walkers, and boarding. We're working on it. Uh, there's actually a task force that is forming up right now. So if anybody feels like they've got something to add to this, they can always uh, send me an email to uh, drmjb, like the coffee, drmjb at fearfreepets.com. So if you have any questions on Fear Free at all, or um, I'm also, by the way, Lisa, this is off topic, but I've been real open about my mo own mental health issues and uh, the fact of, uh, that I fight depression. In fact, I'm in a funk right now. But if anybody ever wants to connect on, on emotional things to talk about things, I'd love for you to email me as well. Oh, thank, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Becker. I, I know that's that's a huge challenge for a lot of people. And it, I really respect your transparency and willingness to share your experience and commitment to helping others. So well, I called my, I actually called my doctor yesterday and said, I, you know, you, you, you think, Oh, this will get better and this will get better. And, and uh, then it well, hasn't been getting better. So I called to find out, you know, what should I change the dosage? Do we need to go back to something else or a new product? And then, I'd been holding, not talking to my wife about it because she has rheumatoid arthritis and when she worries, she flares. And, and so, you know, I did what I tell other people to do. You know, I, I told her and we sat down and talked last night and uh, am doing something different with medication. But yeah, I just want to tell people out there with mental health issues, there's, uh, you know, if you're diabetic, you take insulin. If you have an infection, uh, you take antibiotics. If you're an epileptic, you take anti-seizure medication. If you're low thyroid, you take thyroid. You can't just will yourself to create more serotonin. It's the same thing. And um, I, need a, I need a medication to help give me some happy, happy hormones, you know, just like other people do to create, get more thyroid. So zero shame to doing it. And sadly, too many people suffer and don't, and you know, it's not just medicine either. For a lot of people, it's it's counseling, it's it's uh, prayer, and it's, it's connecting with people. But don't let yourself get to where you just get in those, you know, go to the the dark side of the mountain when you got it. You got the the ways you can come back into the sunshine. Absolutely, very important words. We have another question. Um, Donna writes, often when adopting a pet from a shelter or rescue, especially a senior, you don't know their past histor history, possibly of abuse or neglect. How do you suggest helping the animal learn new behaviors such as to ease food aggression that may have come from hunger or having to compete for food with other dogs? I wish I was in a room where I could just see everybody's faces and then we all give a big hug at the end you know because so many of us care about these animals deeply and you chances are it has not had a good life i will tell you that the chances are it it, it can be nails trimmed too short gums you know mouth can imagine i'm such a baby M my wife my wife has has went to the dentist today to have uh, a root canal she didn't even use any any medication or deadening she had gum surgery without without deadening. And for me, I get a cold sore the size of a pencil eraser and I feel like I need to be hospitalized, you know. C can you imagine the pain that these pets go through? And chances are they were held down in a veterinary hospital and treated something very painful. Chances are uh, they were, uh, they were uh, manhandled, manipulated, threatened, abused. And so you can't, they can't tell you, they can't tell you what happened. They can't tell you the triggers. And that's why we've worked so hard 
to, fig to figure out how do you treat pets like that. So if you go to, if you know, the certifications are really good at helping, but just for the average person that's a foster or works in a, you know, in a, that has pets at home, at, at Fear Free Happy Homes, there is so much content on that stuff by all these experts. So I would just encourage you to go there. And sometimes it's, it's a thing of, you know, how you feed them, where you feed them. Sometimes one of the pets, because there's always a hierarchy, needs to be on something to chill them out a little bit, you know, proverbial a couple glasses of wine at the end of the day. Um, we, have, we have six dogs and one of ours is on a, uh, one of them is on a nutraceutical all the time to just help them live a happy, a happy life. And another one is on a pharmaceutical. But there's lots of stuff on Fear Free Happy Homes. And again, to recommend it to people, everything is reviewed by Board of Veterinary Behaviorists and it's all free. All right. And the, the website is fearfreehappyhomes.com, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then for shelters, if anybody that's in animal rescue or shelters, fearfreeshelters.com, that's free to all, everybody that works at a shelter. Okay. Great. It's a different, it's a different program. It's, it's specifically made for shelter and rescue. It's not the same as like uh, the one that veterinarians would take or trainers or groomers. Okay. Um, we have a question from Steven who writes, every July 4th, both my dogs are afraid of the neighborhood firecracker noise and want to stay under my feet. I'm told it's not good to try to, to comfort them by petting and talking to them. What is the correct way to comfort them during these kind of moments? Okay, I'm, uh, Steven, I'm gonna be direct. You're gonna have to go to medication. There's, we used to go, what I, what I, one thing I can't stand, I've had a syndicated column for over 20 years and, you know, we have a new magazine out, by the way, called Happy Paws that you would love. It's same publishers that do People and Better Homes and Gardens and Magnolia, but it's, we had a whole thing in there about, about noise phobias, thunderstorms, 4th of July. There's, we used to say, oh, go out in the country, you know, board them someplace out in the distance, take them into a, a bedroom with no light and play this music, desensitize them. Nobody's going to do that. They, they don't, uh, it, it's, it takes too much time and is difficult and not that effective. There are some products that work so well for that. So we have six dogs, all but one are, are rescue shelter pets. And two of the six have phenomenal thunderstorm uh, uh, fireworks phobias and up here where there's hunting in Northern Idaho. So one of them we use uh, uh, or, uh, Alprazolam, which is generic Xanax. And it works so well. If there's ever thunderstorms in the forecast or it's July 1st, they are on Alprazolam. And they go through probably July 7th or 8th before we stop giving it. Another one, there's an FDA approved product called Celio, S-I-L-E-O, that works so well. In fact, we use it a lot off-label in veterinary, uh, veterinary medicine to reduce fear, anxiety, and stress. S-I-L-E-O by a company called Zoetis, Z-O-E-T-I-S, Z-O-E-T-I-S. And it's just a gel, dex, dexmedetomidine gel that you rub on the gums of your dog. But literally, it, it, with those products, the thunder, the thunder can hit next to your house. There could be uh, 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 bottle rockets going off next to your house, and it doesn't even phase them. It's literally like turning a light switch off and on. So make sure you talk to your veterinarian, either Alprazolam or Celio, and those of you that live in areas where there's thunderstorms, don't let them suffer through that. They think they're going to die. Right. Um, those are all the questions that we have at the moment. Any, um, oh, actually, we just got another one from Karen. Um, She's, Karen says, my 11-year-old dog is also afraid of thunder and fireworks, and we were told not to give him Alprazolam because it could make him more aggressive. Not true. First of all, first of all, you're, there's, I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock everybody. There are more licensed practicing attorneys in New York City than there are veterinarians in the United States. Do you know in companion animal practice, there's only about 60,000 of us? We wouldn't even have filled the stadium at the Super Bowl. Uh, there's that many, but 
not all veterinarians are as up on the emotional well-being of animals. So they may either be relying on outdated information. I, I had a dog, I'll give you a good example. I fly all the time. I've flown 6 million miles in my life. And anybody that's worked in animal rescue or worked in a shelter knows what anal glands smells like or anybody probably in their own house when they're knows anal glands. I'm in Atlanta and I'm on one of these things where the, where the, the uh, jetway went about 200 yards because it had to go around this part of the building. I, I walked onto the jetway, an extra long jetway, and I could smell anal glands before I got to the plane. And when I went up there and I seated, I could see uh, this carrier moving up and down, but everybody's boarding and, and I, this animal's in extreme distress. Finally, I went over and introduced myself and talked to her and the veterinarian to put that dog on ace promazine. And that's the worst thing you could possibly do for a dog in stress. That's, that's what you used to do for uh, something we thought was gonna tranquilize, but it actually makes it worse. But the, so it's not only didn't help, it's contraindicated. We actually use some ace promazine in what these cocktails. So two hours of what a veterinarian or veterinary nurse learns in, in fear free, uh, to become a fear free certified veterinarian or veterinary nurse is sedation protocols. But Alprazolam is not for every pet. That's why one of our pets is on Celio and another one's on, on uh, Alprazolam or generic Xanax. But I'd uh, take, a look at, take a look at the stuff on Fear Free Happy Homes about thunderstorm and noise phobias. Maybe you can print it out and take it. And, and I hate to say it, everybody always thinks their veterinarian graduated at or near the top of their class. Uh, when in fact, half of them graduated in the bottom half of their class and not everybody embraces this. Some people say, oh, we do it. We just don't call it fear free or others think it's stupid that they just want to focus on holding them down and getting the nails trimmed or not worrying if the pet's shivering, shaking, panning, yawning, jumping. Uh, but luckily there's, you'll be able to find people in your community that do care and do it differently. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, not seeing any other questions right now. Do you have any final thoughts to share or anything well, that's well, important that we didn't touch on? This, is, this has been so much fun. You know, Lisa, I'm, I'm very supportive of your work. I think there's, um, we have adopted, you know, senior pets and, and had, uh, uh, well, on one end, I think we love the smell of puppy breath, uh, which is pretty, I don't know how that, where that all comes from, that sweet carol syrup smell of puppy breath, but, the joy of getting a senior pet into your life and, and helping them in those, make those last few chapters long and happy. I, I just want to tell people, I'm no, I'm no Temple Grandin. You know, Temple Grandin was born with a gift to know what animals felt like and, and know, know, you know, how to prevent or relieve suffering and protect them. And whether it was shadows or whether it was corners or whether it was, movement or slippery surfaces. I was, I was uh, helping stretch cats out into two zip codes to get a blood draw. I've had more than one dog poop in my pocket where there was a struggle. They're trying to get a blood sample and all of a sudden you feel something warm and you reach in your pocket and the dog has pooped in your pocket. I, I wasn't say I've always loved animals. I've been compassionate and I wasn't what I thought rough, but that's, that's what you were taught. And it was only after I had this awakening at the hands of Karen Overall that um, I said my, my life will never be the, the same. And I've, I've then since then dedicated everything. I don't do any other work other than on Fear Free. And it's just been a blessing to see how it's taken off and in all aspects. And look at research and wildlife and zoos and aquariums with, with the way uh, poultry is treated and pork and dairy and I was at a, at a dairy recently this will make you smile it, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal called Dairy Queens and it was about the top 10 percent of dairy herds that in production over 3,000 cow dairies that didn't use BST which is the growth hormone you see you always see no BST on a you know yogurt or something so no growth hormones but this is not a you know 10 cows and they they bring fresh milk to the Saturday market in your hometown. But these cows, there was uh, probably 
30 back scratching stations. So imagine a car wash with those rotating brushes, except a cow goes through it. You know, it, it doesn't sit in a tunnel, it's out sitting out, but a cow goes in there and these back scratching stations scratch its back and its sides. And then it times off and it, they move away. And then another, they're lined up like Starbucks. Uh, there's, you know, a line of 40 cows waiting to go through this back scratching station. They go in and they get milked when they want to be milked. When they feel like getting milked, they go into the barn on their own. And instead of just cleaning the udder, it gives them an udder massage. So it's, it's pleasant to them, plus it helps let the milk down. And then there's music. They have an RFD tag, a radio frequency tag in their ear. And they know certain kinds of music that that cow prefers. So it plays that music for the cow while she's being milked. Uh, it doesn't happen this way, but just imagine beat headphones coming down and this cat, cow listening to classical and this one listening to reggae and, and uh, this one listened to love songs. But there's all these animals. I live on a horse ranch and the person that used to come up and treat our horses was rough. And he'd, you know, the horse would jerk, he'd just hold on to the halter and ride up in like an elevator and come back down. The veterinarian we use now she, her kids make homemade molasses horse treats. And if she happens to be coming by and has time, she'll just drive in real quick and give the horses a molasses treat. Now, every time the horses see her truck come, they run in to see her. She uses very fine gauge needles. The ferry we used to use was so rough. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, by gosh, through his voice or his jerk and he'd get a horse to submit, right? right? Now the farriers all soft touch, giving, giving treats, kind words, uh, touching with these valium points. It's everything has changed and it should change. And even those of us that are out there that have our pets in our, in our house can, uh, can still do things to help them live a happier, healthier, fuller, fuller life. So did you have one more question? It looks like maybe, or no? Um, I think we are done. I think we're good. Okay. Well, hey, yeah. I'm going to remind you again, drmjb at fearfreepets.com if you want to contact me for any reason. And uh, fearfreeshelters.com, complimentary to all shelters. Uh, Fear Free Happy Homes is free to all pet owners. And then if you're a healthcare professional, we'd love you to be one of those 75,000 plus that uh, is part of this team. Thank you very much, Dr. Becker. We've had some some great comments just coming in at the end here, thanking you um, for your great work. So we really appreciate it. Thanks for your time and, and thanks for really changing the world. And thank you too, Lisa, for all, all you guys do. I'm so supportive of you. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Well, thanks, Dr. Bye. Becker. God bless bye -bye. everybody. Bye-bye.